Welcome to Lecture 7, Justifications of Probabilism and Bayesian Learning. For our final lecture, we'll return to questions of deep philosophical concern, namely, the old and new problems of induction. What we'll see is that we may have an answer to those problems in the form of probabilistic and specifically Bayesian learning and that indeed Bayesian learning may provide us with the uniquely rational way to update our beliefs in light of new evidence. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to 1. Explain how Bayesian learning provides a partial answer to the old and new problems of induction. 2. Describe why rational degrees of belief at a time should conform to the axioms of probability theory. And three, describe why rational learning across time should proceed via Bayes' rule. Recall that Hume's problem of induction consisted in the observations that we cannot justify induction inductively on pain of circularity, and that we cannot justify induction deductively, since we do not already know that induction will work, so we cannot include this in the known premises of a deductive argument. And since a sound deductive argument does not include anything in its conclusion that isn't already contained in its premises, we cannot deductively justify induction. Goodman's riddle showed that since nearly any prediction can be made logically consistent with any data, logical consistency is not enough to discriminate between more and less plausible regularities that we might project into the future. Bayesian learning provides a partial answer to both of these problems. In response to Hume's problem that we cannot deductively justify induction, we will see that if we allow ourselves one assumption, that our current beliefs contain a grain of truth, then we can actually deductively demonstrate that probabilistic learning via Bayes' rule will converge to the truth as we acquire more evidence. In response to Goodman's riddle, that logical consistency is insufficient to discriminate between more and less plausible regularities, we will see that, while this is true, we can use something other than logical consistency, namely probability, as a way to discern and measure the plausibility of different regularities. Our first answer comes in the form of a theorem demonstrating that Bayesian agents will converge to the truth. The earliest proofs of this result are attributable to the mathematician Joseph Dube in 1948, with later generalizations by the statistician David Friedman in 1963 and 65. The theorem goes as follows. Let an agent have probabilistic credences over a countably infinite algebra of propositions. This is the space of possibilities that she entertains. As long as she has non-zero prior probability on the true hypothesis, that is, she has not, before she be, has be, began learning, ruled it out as impossible, then she will converge to believing the true hypothesis as she obtains more and more evidence. Let's consider a toy example to wrap our heads around what Bayesian convergence involves. To do this, let's return to our familiar setup of attempting to learn the bias of a coin by re observing repeated flips of that coin. Our hypotheses will be two, 
that the coin is biased three quarters heads, and that the coin is biased one quarters heads. Our data will be simply the sequence of outcomes of flips of the coin, where the outcomes are recorded as one denoting heads and zero denoting tails. Let the true hypothesis be H1, that the coin is actually biased three quarters heads. And let's generate some data through flipping this biased coin. We would now update on the data via Bayes rule in the familiar way. As long as our prior on the true hypothesis that the coin is biased three quarters heads was not zero to begin with, learning via Bayes will get us to converge to probability one on the true hypothesis in the limit of infinite data. As an aside, we might want to check why we need non-zero probability on the true hypothesis. The reason is that if we start with probability zero on a hypothesis, we can never increase our probability in it. Similarly, if we start with probability one in a hypothesis, we can never decrease our probability in it. Notice that if a hypothesis has probability zero, then as we update via Bayes rule, we will get our posterior by taking the product of the likelihood and the prior. And if the prior is zero, the entire term reduces to zero. And so no matter what evidence we get for a hypothesis, starting with probability zero leaves us always stuck at probability zero. As a moral, in probabilistic learning, one should not apply probability zero or one to any hypothesis about which we actually want to learn. Returning to our example, let's say we were initially indifferent between the two hypotheses. So our priors were given by the probability of H1 being equal to H2 being one half then updating on our data would look as follows. As we observe our sequence of data, the first is a one, or heads. And so via Bayes rule, we get a posterior probability of three quarters. We use three quarters as our new prior, updating on the next flip of the coin, which was also a heads, which increases our probability and the coin being biased three quarters heads up to nine tenths. And in the third step, we update again and on and on. Over time, our probability will converge to the truth. More generally, we can start with any priors as long as our priors do not rule out the possibility of the true hypothesis. And from that state, Bayes' rule will deliver us with enough evidence to probability one on the true hypothesis and probability zero on all false hypotheses. Now we considered convergence for the toy example of there being two hypotheses over the bias of a coin. But Bayesian convergence results apply generally, meaning no matter what we're learning about. That is, if there are infinitely many hypotheses that might be extraordinarily complex in nature, we get the same guarantee of convergence. What we've seen is that while we cannot know that any given inductive inference will be correct, for example, we can never be absolutely certain that the sun will rise tomorrow because it has so far, we can know that as long as we start with non-zero probability on the true hypothesis, we can converge to that truth as we get more and more data. For example, we can become arbitrarily confident that the medicine will be effective. In this sense, we can deductively justify induction via Bayes' rule. Now let's turn to Goodman's riddle of induction.
and to a familiar example of sequence prediction, where we have the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and our task is to predict which number will come next. Our challenge was that there are infinitely many generating functions, or hypotheses, that are logically consistent with the sequence, and would continue the sequence in distinct ways, and yet all were not equally plausible. This is the problem that logical consistency is not enough. We can solve this problem using probabilistic inference. Consider the set of all those possible generating functions, that infinite set. If you know, for example, that I produced the generating function, which I did, and you know that I'm lazy, then you might give shorter generating functions a higher plausibility. In particular, you might give them a higher prior probability than longer generating functions. So, for example, you might have a prior over the length of the generating functions. Here, I present one example of a geometric discounting prior that places a probability that is greater on functions that are shorter and that decreases as the length of the generating function gets longer. We now have a prior probability that sums to 1 and applies positive probability to all possible generating functions. So, given our Bayesian convergence result, we're guaranteed to converge to the truth as we get more data, namely, more elements of the sequence. And this also ranks those hypotheses, that is to say, discriminates between them by their plausibility. Now, we could do this in many ways, that is, formulate priors that capture our judgments about plausibility, depending on what we think makes a hypothesis more or less likely. Looking at the case of figuring out the right function for population growth, we can apply a similarly clever prior over all computable functions, that is, all the functions we could ever calculate using a computer. And this prior would apply positive probability to the infinity of possible computable functions. And so again, we retain the guarantee that we'll converge to the truth as we gather more data. And we can also formulate it to capture our notions of plausibility. So given what we know about how populations tend to grow, we could rank the plausibility of hypotheses in a natural way. For example, we might find the blue function more plausible than the red one that zigzags up and down because we think populations typically don't behave with that level of volatility. So in our prior, we would have the hypothesis corresponding to the blue function as being larger than the prior probability of the function corresponding to the red line. In this way, we have an answer both to Hume's problem of how to justify induction, which is, with a modest assumption, the grain of truth condition will converge to the truth as we get more evidence, and a response to Goodman's riddle that logical consistency is not enough, for which we have, we can use probability to do the work needed. The fact of Bayesian convergence is part of why Bayesian learning has so many applications across the worlds of cryptography, genomics, artificial intelligence, and finance. For deeper and rigorous explorations of Bayesian convergence, I invite you to look at Dube's 1953 text on stochastic processes and UCI's own Simon Huttiger and his 2017 text on the probabilistic foundations of rational learning. But perhaps we might be thinking there are many inductive methods. For example, frequentist hypothesis testing, 
maximum likelihood estimates, or mere guesswork. The way that we infer that the sun will rise tomorrow because it's risen in the past. Some of these could possibly converge to the truth as well. Is there any reason to think that Bayesian learning gives us the right inductive logic? What we will see is that formulating our beliefs as probabilities and updating these beliefs using Bayes' rule upon receiving new evidence has been found in some sense to be the uniquely rational way to learn and predict the optimal inductive logic. Specifically, we will see that each coherent betting behavior and accurate prediction require an agent's belief at a time to be probabilities, and that she change her beliefs across time via Bayes' rule. The first thesis is probabilism, that our beliefs should conform to the now familiar axioms of probability theory. The second thesis is Bayesian conditioning, that we should change our beliefs in light of new evidence using Bayes' rule. Let's begin with our first thesis. Why our beliefs should conform at a time to the probability axioms. There are actually several lines of converging argument and mathematical result that arrive at this conclusion but I will present you two of the more famous and more accessible arguments for why our beliefs should conform to the probability axioms. The first is the Dutch book argument, which demonstrates that if an agent's beliefs are not probabilities, then this licenses her to engage in incoherent betting behavior. The second is the accuracy argument, which demonstrates that if an agent's beliefs are not probabilities, then she will always be predictively dominated by another agent whose beliefs are probabilities. According to the Dutch book argument, having degrees of belief that are not probabilities is irrational because it licenses incoherent betting behavior. The argument goes that credences that license incoherent betting behavior are irrational. Credences that violate the probability axioms license incoherent betting behavior. Thus, credences that violate the probability axioms are irrational. An important interpretation of credences is in terms of bets one be would be willing to take. Your credence on an event P is the fair price you ascribe to a gamble that returns $1 on P and $0 on not P. For example, if you think that a coin of is fair, so your credence in heads is equal to your credence in tails is equal to 0.5, then you would be willing to pay 50 cents for either a gamble that returns $1 on heads or for one that returns $1 on tails. With this, we can offer a Dutch book argument for the probability axioms, where a Dutch book is a set of bets which guarantees a loss to the better, regardless of the outcome. Let's see how this works. What we're going to do is to introduce different credences that violate the probability axioms, for each of which we will produce a Dutch book. That is, we will take an imagined agent who has those credences and then buy and sell her gambles based off of her credences that will ensure us a guaranteed profit and her a guaranteed loss. We, that is, we will make book against her. 
Recall that a credence of x for an event p is the fair price the better would pay for a gamble that returns $1 if p occurs and $0 if not p occurs. Here we use $1 bets. However, I'd note that this could be made arbitrarily large. So we could pay our agent a thousand times x for a gamble that pays back a thousand dollars if p occurs and nothing if not p occurs and so on. For simplicity, here we stay with the one dollar bet. We can buy and sell any of these gambles to this agent. Here the gambles are on p and not p and her stated prices are x and y corresponding to her credences. To see how this works, Imagine that we buy from our better a gamble on P at her price of X, and we sell to our better the gamble on not P at her price of Y. Then we can calculate our payout in each case. If P occurs, we first consider the money we have made from selling her not P which is y, minus the price we paid to her from buying p, which is x. And then we add to our payout the payment for the gamble we bought that turned out true. So we bought p from her, and that turned out true. So she gives us $1. And we subtract from this the gambles that we sold that turned out to be true. And in our case, those are none because we sold her the gamble on not P. The general formula for calculating our payout is we take the money we got from selling gambles, subtract the money we lost from buying gambles, add the money we gain from buying gambles that turned out to be true, and subtract the money we lost from paying out for gambles that turned out to be true. So let's calculate our payout when not p occurs, which is y for having sold not p to the better, minus x for having bought p from the better, minus zero for none of the bets we bought coming true, minus 1 for the gamble we sold, not P, coming true. So let's consider our first violations of the probability axioms. Here we have an agent whose credences are 0.6 on P and 0.5 on not P. What to notice is that this is a violation of the unitarity axiom. Specifically, because her probabilities for the tautology are implicitly greater than 1. To see why that's so, consider that the tautology is equivalent to p or not p, which by additivity gives us a probability equal to the probability of p plus the probability of not p, which is equal to 0 0.6 plus 0 0.5 given her credences which is 1.1, which is greater than 1. So this is a violation of unitarity. Let's go ahead and make a Dutch book for this better and guarantee her a sure loss and us a sure profit. In this case, we can simply sell her the gamble on P as well as the gamble on not P. We calculate our payout in the familiar way. So we sold two gambles for a gain of 0.6 and 0.5 dollars. We subtract what we bought, which was nothing, and we add what we bought that turned out to be true, which is nothing, since we bought nothing. And we pay to her the gambles that we sold to her that turned out to be true. 
which is one dollar. So 0 0.6 plus 0 0.5 minus 1 leaves us with a profit of 10 cents when p occurs. Similarly, when not p occurs, we consider that we have sold p and not p gambles to her for $1.1, and now we pay out the $1 for not p occurring, and that leaves us with a profit in both cases. That is, an agent with such credences can be committed to a sure loss no matter what. That's not good. We can consider what happens if your probabilities are not greater but lower than 1 on the tautology. Similarly, we see if that she assigns 0.4 or 0.3. This gives her a credence implicitly of 0.8 on the tautology, which is less than 1. In this case, we'll simply buy both yambles from her and calculate our payout for each case? Well, if P occurs, we bought both gambles, which cost us 0.7, and we get the payout for the gamble on P that we bought, leaving us with a profit of 30 cents. And similarly, if not P occurs, we have the cost of the 70 cents for having bought both gambles, but the profit of a dollar on the gamble we bought on not P leaving us again with a payout of 30 cents. An agent with credences that are less than unity or more than unity experiences a sure loss. Now let's consider an agent with the following credences. This is, among other things, a violation of non-negativity. She has a credence of less than zero on not P. Here we sell her the gamble on P at her price of 1.1 and buy from her her gamble on not P for a price of negative 0.1. Calculating our payout, we have that we sold our better the gamble on P for 1.1, and we bought from our better the gamble on not P for negative 0.1. That is, she paid us 0.1 to give us the gamble on not P. And neither of the gambles, uh, or rather the gamble we bought, did not come out true, so we add zero. And the gamble we sold, P, did come out true, so we pay out one to the better. This leaves us with 20 cents. Now, if not P occurs, again, we sold 1.1 and bought negative 0.1. But now we're also paid out for our gamble on not P coming out true and don't have to pay out for the gamble on P that we sold, which didn't come out true, for a payout of $2.2. In each case, the better experiences a sure loss, and we experience a sure profit. Now let's consider a violation of finite additivity. Let P and Q be mutually exclusive propositions, or events. Then we have that the events P, Q, and not P or Q are mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive of the possible outcomes. Here our better has probabilities of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.6 on the possible outcomes, P, Q, and neither P nor Q. The violation of additivity comes as follows. Consider the probability of P or Q. We know that this must be equal to 1 minus the probability of neither P nor Q. That is, 1 minus 0.6, given our agent's credences, 
which is equal to 0.4. So we've given an implicit probability to p or q of 0.4. But since p and q are mutually exclusive, we know that this means that the probability of p plus the probability of q should be equal to the probability of p or q, or 0.4. But instead, the probability of p plus the probability of q is equal to 0.2 plus 0.3, or 0.5, by this agent's credences. In this way, she violates finite additivity. To make a book against her, we will simply sell her all of the gambles at her stated prices. This yields the payouts as follows. If p occurs, then we first consider that we have gained 0.6 plus 0.2 plus 0.3 for having sold her each of the gambles. We bought none, and of course we bought none that were true, but now we must pay out to her one dollar because the gamble of p that we sold her turned out true. Similarly, for q and neither key p nor q. In each case, we've sold all gambles, so we have the payment of 1.1 for the sum of them. In each case, one of them comes true, so we pay out one dollar to our better. And in every case, we are, have a payout of 10 cents. Violating additivity guarantees that our better is vulnerable to such a Dutch book. Are there credences that cannot be Dutch booked? Indeed there are. If an agent's credences conform to the probability axioms, uniquely then there is no set of bets that can guarantee a sure loss for her. That is, an agent whose beliefs or probabilities cannot be Dutch booked. It's important to note that now we have both directions. If beliefs or credences are not probabilities, they are vulnerable to a Dutch book. They can always be committed to a sure loss. And beliefs that are probabilities can never be committed to a sure loss. Here, I will present you with a few examples of trying and failing to Dutch book our agent whose beliefs are probabilities. Here you notice that they sum to one, none are negative, and the mutually exclusive propositions, P and not P, have a probability of their disjunction, which is equal to the sum of their probabilities. If we buy from them both of the gambles at their fair price, a quick calculation will reveal that they experience no loss in either case. And if we sell to them both of their gambles at their fair price, again they experience no loss in either case. But if we buy P and sell not P, we get a profit of 0.4 if the event they think more probable, P, occurs and a profit of negative uh, 1.6, that is, we experience a loss when not P occurs. So even though an agent whose beliefs are probabilities can indeed be committed to a loss, they cannot be committed to a guaranteed loss. Because if, for example, not P occurs, then they will be making off of us and not the other way around. And similarly, if we sell them P and buy from them not P, in the event that P occurs, we pay out to them 40 cents. And in the event that not P occurs, they pay out to us a dollar and 60. Which makes sense in that they have applied a lower probability to not P, meaning that they were willing to bet more against it and a higher probability on P meaning they are willing to pay less on it. Another compelling argument for why our beliefs ought to conform to the probability axioms 
is the accuracy argument, which demonstrates that if an agent's beliefs are not probabilities, she will always be dominated in accuracy by another agent whose beliefs are probabilities. The reasoning is as follows. Credences that are accuracy dominated are irrational. Credences that violate the probability axioms are accuracy dominated. Thus, credences that violate the probability axioms are irrational. Consider credences that we could apply to the propositions P and not P, and let's graph them as points in this space. This diagonal line going from the upper left to the lower right captures the set of all credences over P and not P that satisfy the probability axioms, namely those that have P and not P as non-negative and sum to 1. A credence off this line, then, violates the probability axioms in one way or another. Let's denote these credences in red. Now we need a notion of accuracy. For this, we'll introduce an inaccuracy score. Here, we're going to be using what is sometimes called the Briar score, which takes the squared difference from our credence on P from the true value of P. The lower the inaccuracy score, the better. And the reason that we've chosen this squared error inaccuracy score is that it is a proper scoring rule, where a proper scoring rule is one that makes it so that the best score one can achieve in expectation is produced by expressing one's honest credences. So let's see how this works by calculating the inaccuracy of these credences. First, let's let P be true, so the event P occurs, which means that the truth value of P is 1 and the truth value of not P is equal to 0. We had that our credences in red assigned both P and not P 0.2. The inaccuracy score then would be the difference between the credence in P and its value, 1, its truth value, 1 squared, plus the difference in not P and its truth value squared, which gives us 0.68. And for the probabilistic credences, we will choose the nearest probabilistic credences to our non-probabilistic credences. Indeed, we'll do this by a measure of nearness given in Euclidean distance, so in a familiar geometric way. This gives us the credences of 0.5 on P and 0.5 on not P in our blue credence function, C prime. As a score, then, this will be the squared difference of 0.5 and 1 for both P and not P, which yields an inaccuracy of only 0.5. So our probabilistic credences were more accurate than our non-probabilistic credences in the case where P was true. However, allowing P to be false does no better for our non-probabilistic credences. Calculating the numbers, again we find that the probabilistic credences outperform our non-probabilistic credences. And this will hold true generally. For any non-probabilistic credence function, C, there will be another credence function, C prime, that is different from C only in that it is the nearest probability function to C and will outperform C no matter what state of the world obtains.
that is, for any non-probability function c generally, it will always be more inaccurate than its nearest probability function c prime. Hence, both optimal betting and optimal prediction require that our beliefs be probabilities. Though we'd note that the fact that our beliefs are probabilities does not guarantee that we are behaving optimally in all respects. One can imagine that we have probabilities, so we're not doing anything incoherent with our betting, and we're not using a prediction that has an obviously better and nearby prediction available, but it doesn't mean that we're right. Maybe I'm betting too much on a football team winning, when in fact I should be betting on it losing. What these requirements give us is that our beliefs, however well or poorly informed by the world, to be minimally rational should be probabilities. Probabilism gives us constraints for what our credences should be at a time. The thesis for Bayesian conditioning gives us constraints for the relationship between our credences across time. Though we will not go into them here, we can also prove very closely related results, known as the diachronic versions of the Dutch book and accuracy arguments for Bayesian learning. That is, if we change our credences across time by any rule that is not equivalent to Bayes' rule, then, just as we saw with credences that do not conform to the probability calculus, we can show that we are committed to incoherent betting behavior, that we can be committed to sets of bets that guarantee a sure loss for us, and that our predictions will be accurately dominated by someone who did update her credences using Bayes' rule. In sum, Bayesian learning will converge to the truth as we acquire more evidence, as long as our priors contain a grain of truth. And both optimal betting and optimal prediction across time also require that we update our beliefs using Bayes' rule. For deeper reading into these and related topics, I would recommend Luke Bovin's 2003 text on Bayesian epistemology and E.T. Jane's classic 1979 text Probability Theory, The Logic of Science. Looking back, what we have seen is that Bayesian learning, while it does not guarantee that induction will work, can guarantee that, if our beliefs contain a grain of truth, we will converge to the truth as we re acquire more evidence. And that further, we have compelling arguments that rational belief at a time and rational learning across time uniquely require that our beliefs conform to the probability axioms and that we update those beliefs using Bayes' rule. May you have a great journey, one filled with good judgment and Bayesian learning. Be well.